sure that you can ask a question, comment. I just want to introduce myself, first of all, because some of you know me and some maybe not as well. And I do my one minute intro. So my name's Efren Olivares and I was born and raised in Mexico City. Um, after a long career in corporate marketing here in the US, mostly New York, some California, some Paris and Madrid, I went back to school after a layoff and got a Master's of Art at Christie's Education. And one of the med mediums that most fascinated me was photography. And upon graduating, I did an internship at the Christie's Photographs Department and then worked at CPI, a gallery that focuses on photography in Chelsea. And now, uh, if you see my logo down here, I created this little company called Look at New York Art. And it's about taking people out and doing tours of galleries. And now due to COVID, I've been doing these lectures and talks on photography. And I'm so delighted to see so many of you coming back and back because it makes me, it makes me know and think that you're, you're learning, you're having fun, they're not boring, they're not totally a snore fest. And you're willing to do this even right before the debates tonight. So I'm thrilled. Um, tonight is a fun, fun subject. I call it Creatures of the Night. And we're going to talk about night photography, but in particular, not photography of, you know, beautiful empty landscapes or cityscapes. We're going to talk about human beings and creatures out at night, which is fun because, you know, at night, as we know, anything is possible. Romance, love, dancing, celebration, but also crime and vice and illicit things. So we're gonna do a little bit of everything. And I warn you, it's a tons of slides, but I think we're gonna fun journey through the entire 20th century and beyond. Um, I want us to start by just talking a little bit about the historical challenges of night photography. Because just to remind you, photography essentially arrived in the 1830s and practically the entire 19th century, there was no night photography. And why is that? Well, guess what? You need sunlight and at night there's no sunlight. And the materials and the technology in the 19th century were just not very light sensitive. So whether you were use, using wet plates or light sensitive paper, they just didn't pick up enough the light not only that, of course, there wasn't electricity, so the light that was available was from gas lamps, et cetera. So you're, you're talking about just not a lot of light. The other thing I want you to know is in photography, we talk about exposure times. And back then, you literally had to wait sometimes 10 to 30 minutes sitting there with the camera before the image could actually be recorded. And we're talking about people that would sit there trying to get a fabulous scene and then suddenly a horse and buggy would go by and that was the end of your image. So it's like crazy, right? And then guess what? There was no lack, there was no flash photography and we're, I'm gonna show you some of the early, really early flash photography. It was like explosions. So let's start with this gentleman. He's considered one of the earliest photographers of, at night. He's working in London, as you can see. And I just want you to know that I, I wanted to start be before there were creatures, because people moving around was not going to work with those long exposures. So this is kind of what he could do. He could sit there with an enormous camera, as you know, back in the time, with tripods and whatnot, and big glass plates. And he would go around, and I, to the point that a policeman was following him, going like, what in the world is this man doing, carrying all that stuff? I mean, it's a beautiful image. He's using whatever available light it is at twilight and from some of these lamps. But as you can see, there's no creatures. And guess what? This lady, this woman, Jessie Tarbox Beals, is considered not only the first female photojournalist, but also the first woman shooting at night. Again, look at, look at the camera and the, 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 you know, what she has to move around with. And she's known for hustling and really kind of like being this go-getter. She broke all sorts of barriers. But again, look at the kind of image she would take. 
no creatures, no moving people. It's just like, it's still, you have to be there with your big camera or this wonderful image. Again, she's making the most out of the available light, but this is not about people moving around. This is, this is just still cityscapes. And I thought this was so funny, just to give you an idea of what used to go on. In 1905, this newspaper reported that an explosion happened, a flashlight powder set off by two photographers, one of them a woman, and that was her. And just as the crowds were pouring out of the Garrett Theater, it caused tremendous excitement and considerable damage. What I'm showing you here is a demonstration of what early magnesium flash powder <laughs> used to look like. Windows in several houses were broken. Scores of families brought out of bed by the detonation, which rang through three blocks, came scurrying into the street. So I just wanted to give you an idea that trying to shoot people coming out of a theater with this kind of flash photography was very, very tricky. Let me move this out of the way. Uh, by the time we get to the pictorialists, you may remember these are the artists like Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen who are trying to elevate photography to the level of painting and more respected arts. And, and yes, you know, you start seeing here some horse and carriages, but you know, they're not really moving. They had reduced exposure times at this point. But if you look at their photography, you're still not going to see all sorts of action with people. It's going to tend to be like this gorgeous print. This is a platinum print that was actually treated with some additional pigments. That's why you see that beautiful coloration. And uh, by the way, a little factoid, you know, the Flatiron Building was considered then one of the tallest buildings in New York. And it's not by accident, it's not cropping. He literally could not fit the flat iron into the shot from what I understand. I wanted to just show you finally, as far as the very early, early photography, these brothers in Arequipa, Peru. Not a lot of people know them, but it's unbelievable that when you go back, these brothers, by the way, Arequipa apparently was this very bohemian, city with artists and it was you know really attracting a lot of european influence look what they did they knew that exposure times were really long they actually set up this they told these nice men you're gonna sit there and stand there for 30 minutes they added artificial lighting but they were very smart they hid it so it's probably back here, we can't see it. So they create these incredible, incredible images. Uh, here you have these silhouetted figures. Here you've got obviously more light. And you're not gonna believe what that is. If you see those, those are stars. But the reason they look like lines is because that's how much time it's taken for this image to be recorded. <laughs> the earth is turning. <laughs> Another fabulous image by these brothers. This, is, this would look like you just took a quick camera and you shot it. No, these people were standing there for 30 minutes. There's artificial light to create this incredible scene. Let's move on to probably, you know, one of the most important iconic photographers of nighttime. Originally from Hungary, his name, his, his, the name he uses is Brasai. He's known as Brasai. You're gonna say, I don't wanna destroy his Hungarian name, but it was something like Julia Halas. Um, why Brasai? He's from the town of Brasov, Transylvania, now Romania. And uh, he arrived in Paris in 1924 and got a camera by 29. And guess what? In Paris, there was a photographer by the name of Andrei Kertesz from Hungary who became his mentor. So he went around with Kertesz and started loving photography. And what Brassai is famous for is being kind of the first groundbreaking artist that went around the streets 
of Paris at night and basically wanted to compile what is nightlife in Paris like. And he called this book, which he designed himself and released in 1933, Paris de Nuit, Paris at Night. Some of the images are breathtaking and don't have creatures like this one. And by the way, I, I had the pleasure of living right by the Seine in Paris for about two years. And it's amazing. It still kind of looks just like this. I mean, it's absolutely breathtaking. And you can see he's making use of the available lights again and the reflection, and it's just breathtaking. But what's fun about Versailles is his his exploration of really the people of, of Paris as well. So Paris is known for romance, of course, so you've got to have the lovers under a lamp. And this is just a beautifully composed image. Now, what I want you to know about Brassai is that guess what? He's carrying an enormous camera with a flash, with a tripod. So these people know he's there. So something really important to know, I want you to think about this throughout this talk. Are we talking about a photographer that's doing a quick, candid, voyeuristic snapshot? Or is this someone that's setting up equipment, telling these people, here I am, I'm taking your shot. Believe it or not, with Brassai, it's always the latter. There's no way he's gonna get these photographs without people's knowledge. Here we are inside, a really happy bar, bistro. Uh, it's so Parisian because we love those banquettes and the mirrors behind that are typical. And of course, what's fabulous about that is that we get to see these friends hanging out, but what I love is we get to see who they're hanging out with, <laughs> you know, because they are in the picture frame thanks to the mirror. And again, these people know that he's standing right there with his big, big camera and with a big flash. And by the way, when Brassai was using flash, it was much improved from the one I said I showed you earlier, that explosion. And yet Picasso called Brassai the little terrorist because of the explosions that he still had with his flashes. So flash photography was still pretty tricky. I love this wonderful couple. Again, you would think he's catching them by surprise. This is pretty much, I'm taking your picture. I love again, the mirrors, because we wouldn't know what he looks like if he weren't right there. And we see them here again. And I just love that it's this kind of intimate corner and she just, she looks so happy. I love just juxtaposing this because one couple on the left looks very happy. And then the one on the right, he actually called it lover's quarrel and they don't look so happy. And again, he must have said, hey, you're having a fight. Let me take a picture. What's fascinating about Versailles and the world of Paris in the 1930s is that you know, you see all kinds of things that by today's standards, you would think, my God, really? You have this, you know, this couple of women with one of them very dainty and feminine and the other one, basically, I'm wearing a suit and tie or these young men dancing away in their suits. So there's this whole richness to Brassai's uh, exploration. Um, you know, he went to very high-end places. He went to bistros. He took photos of these really interesting characters. Here's Madame Bijou, and she's completely full of jewels and a hat. And one of the things about Madame Bijou that I've discussed with my friend Harold is, we don't really know if she's really Madame Bijou, or it, it might be a messiah that is called Madame Bijou. We don't know, but that's what makes it so fun. He went into brothels, uh, part of what made him famous is that you were seeing the Paris that nice people don't see all the time. So here we are uh, capturing, you know, he's capturing this, this lady of the night with a man in a brothel and certainly prostitutes both in the street and this, this one on the right. I, I love how she's looking straight at the camera, straight at us, almost like, yeah, what do you want to do about it? 
um, kind of a tough, tough cookie. And then finally, to close Brassai, I, I found this kind of fun and outrageous because this is at Chez Suzy, which is clearly a brothel, and they call this scene La Presentación. So it's like they're the ladies are presenting themselves to the customer, which <laughs> it looks so outrageous, right? It's like, oh my God, they're standing there stark naked, like, choose me. So to close Versailles, probably still to this day, the most iconic groundbreaking photographer of early days of the night. I threw in the next photographer, Ilsa Bing, not because she's necessarily known for her night photography, but because she happened to also arrive in Paris in 29. And what I wanted to show you is that she is called the Queen of the Leica. And the Leica was this wonderfully small, horrible German camera that used film. So I just wanted to show you that that was like, oh my God, so you mean she can actually run around? She doesn't have to like tell the people, here I am with my enormous camera. And I love this because this is a beautiful image at a ball and she's clearly leaning over in a way that it would have been very hard for Brassai to do with his equipment. And you see this wonderful scene of these people very dressed up at a ball from above. But what I just wanted to show you are some of her really iconic pictures of the Moulin Rouge. Because wait, you know, during this talk, we're gonna stop in a lot of the famous clubs. If we're talking about creatures of the night, we have to go to where the action is. So Ilsa Bing went to the Moulin Rouge and here you can see that she's gonna show us a lot of scenes that are probably much easier to do when you have a little portable camera and you're running around and you're kind of moving around. And I love this one because it captures all the people dancing and the band and certainly the, 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 you know, the, the lit up male in the back. And then these people obviously kind of just very still and being entertained. And of course, the Moulin Rouge is most famous for the can-can. And this image I love because the amount of movement and dynamism is just incredible, right? Uh, that blurriness, they're all lifting their skirt as they famously do. But also, if you look at the vantage point, it's almost this tilted, weird, like, it reminds us of like when Cezanne used to have his apples and they look like they're falling out of the frame. I mean, these ladies look like they're coming into our space. And again, it's, it's, it's like a very exciting image to, to look at. And then he would, you know, she, she, sorry, would go and here's the lady twirling and here's the dancer lifting up her skirt and here's the one doing her split. So I like this because it, it does show you that even that early on, um, others were running around. And by the way, that's not that different from the famous photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was running around with smaller cameras to capture what he called the decisive moment. You know, you're gonna run around and capture stuff quickly without setting it up. And lastly, for Ilsa being in the Moulin Rouge, I threw this in just because I had no idea, but apparently there were fights at the Moulin Rouge. So I, I want to explore that more, but I particularly like the fact that, you know, the one kind of getting him ready for the fight is this adorable woman with her little patent leather heels. Let's talk about Bill Brand because he's a very important photographer from Britain from the 20th century. And guess what? He liked what Brassai did in Paris and he was like, well, I'll do a book called A Night in London, Not To Be Left Behind. It was published in 1938. And once again, Bill Brand also, he's back to the big camera and the lights. And I love this because he's going around London in one night and capturing the kinds of creatures that you see. And here's this man, um, probably, I don't know, putting out a gas lamp, turning it on. I love if you notice how there's all these vertical 
vertical columns, vertical lamb, vertical gate, vertical shadow, but then you've got these wonderful kind of diagonals going on both here and there. And as my friend Harold trained me to see, he, the light is coming from a different direction. If you notice, you wouldn't have a shadow here unless the light were coming from someone who has it here. And then you've got the photographer here. This is a great scene because Bill Brandt would actually use friends and people he knew and his wife and create these scenes. So it, it was funny because it's not just, oh, I bumped into these people. Some of it is a little bit set up kind of in the Brassai style. And, and this looks like kind of an eerie scene, but he actually knows these people. And I love the, the shadows and the darkness of this kind of like, what's going on here? The man is accosting someone. I like this one just because I'm kind of jealous. She's going out for the night in pre-war London and she's getting into this enormous car. <laughs> And then on the other side of things, there's these men kind of getting ready for their day at Covent Garden and they've arrived there with all their wares and the stuff they're gonna sell. I love that this one pretty much carries things on his head. I love that this is not a Starbucks with paper cups. A proper gentleman, even in the street, has a real cup and saucer for his tea. And this is fantastic. It's these five policemen kind of taking their notes, either of what they need to do or of what they saw. And if you notice, it looks to me like he's either cheating or trying to see what his colleague is writing. If you look, it's like, hmm, he's gonna get promoted before me or something. Um, one of the things that was fascinating is Bill Brandt was asked by the Ministry of Information to capture the, the air raid shelters during the Blitz and during World War II. And I thought these would be interesting to share. Uh, when I saw these, I thought, you know, we might think sitting around watching Netflix with COVID <laughs> is bad. We're not sleeping in the underground with hundreds of other people. So let's put it all in perspective. Um, and by the way, one of the things Bill Brandt did, which is also famous, but I'm not showing it, is that he went around London when they would have the blackout, because you know they would turn off all the lights during these raids and stuff. So he actually like went out and captured London like when it's totally, totally dark. Back in the US, we're talking 1930s, so we can't forget that Harlem was having a renaissance. If you're interested in that topic, James Van Der Zee is usually considered kind of like the most iconic, accomplished photographer of the Harlem Renaissance. I'm showing you this photograph, not because it's at night, but just because it's one of his most iconic. And this is the kind of thing, he had a studio, but he would also take people. And he was really showing people kind of very well dressed, doing incredibly well in Harlem uh, at a point in which it was really thriving. Unfortunately, some of the pictures or photographs I found of the Cotton Club are not necessarily, sometimes they don't have dates, sometimes they don't even have who the artist is. But I just wanted to show you that, of course, folks were documenting what was going on in the very famous Cotton Club. Here's the Duke Ellington band. I like this one because it captures these men exactly when they're clapping, but I also love that she's like totally aware. <laughs> she's like, ah, oh, my, my picture's being taken, I'm gonna look away. Um, really, really wonderful. And then this just caught my eye just because it's like, it turns out this little boy had lost his leg or part of his leg in a cut mill accident, as so often happened when kids were being put to work in the early part of the century, as you know, Lewis Hine documented that. And he went by peg leg, and he was an amazing tap dancer. And I love this photograph because it really has that element of decisive moment captured in the air. 
and you actually see the wonderful shadows you know it's like you have two of him you've got him and then you've got his shadow almost in perfect sync of course I wanted to throw this in some people might say well is that really night photography well we're not sure because it is the subway um, but I wanted to show it too because it is about creatures out and it might very well be the nighttime. Um, Walker Evans, you know him, he's one of the most important photographers of the 20th century, particularly known for his images during the Depression and down in Alabama of sharecropper families. But back in 1938, guess what? Now we're talking about that secret, I'm taking people secretly without their knowing. He took this little 35 millimeter contact camera and he hid it under his coat. And the lens was just peering out through two of his buttons. And he had a little wire running through his, like, to his hand. And he sat in the subway very often with his friend, Helen Levitt, another photographer. And he would wait to take these pictures of strangers on the train. And they're really wonderful because They've been, they've been talked about as almost like unposed portraits, right? We'll see a, an artist later at Studio 54 that also wanted to capture people not posing. It's like, I want to get them not looking happy at my camera. Um, so here are these wonderful ladies, kibitzing, gossiping. Here's these two young women. We don't know what they're looking at, but it's really fun because one has a veil. And one, I mean, they're wearing these heavy coats that look, clearly looks like a very cold time. Uh, but I wanted to share that series with you. If you want to explore it more, there's tons of these photographs of these subway riders. And I think it's quite groundbreaking because it really is about this ability to hide a little camera under your coat and take portraits of strangers. So now we get to, we're about halfway, one of the most important photographers of, of night photography, um, but in this case, very particular kinds of night photography. Born Usher Felig, he actually got to the US as a little boy and his father changed his name to something that would be a little more American, like Arthur. And he eventually, through many ways, got the pseudonym or nickname of Ouija. Um, and there's Ouija. And what's funny about Ouija is that he, in a way, I guess could have been using one of the little small cameras. I, I don't, I'm, I admit, I don't know enough about why he was still using this kind of format camera and his big flash, but some of you experts will tell me, because he was running around the streets of New York, and yet he was doing it in his car and with this, this pretty massive stuff. Um, I think it might have been because he, well, anyway, he didn't want film. I think he wanted to do his own developing very quickly on the spot and send it to newspapers. What Ouija is known for is exploring, I would say, some of the darker sides of New York late at night. Um, this is not so dark. It's Shorty, the, the Bowery <laughs> cherub, <laughs> New Year's Eve in the Bowery. Um, but he did skew towards things that were a little bit more salacious and sensationalist for, you know, the daily, the daily news and the post and the sun. It's like, I want to get them like crazy, crazy night stuff. Here's a man that's completely drunk. And what's wild is that these people are not exactly coming to his help. He might have been thrown out of the bar and they're all just laughing. Um, this is one of his most famous images, and you've got these clearly very, very um, wealthy ladies at what used to be the old Metropolitan Opera House, pre-Lincoln Center. And as they're walking there in their gorgeous outfits, there's this woman, um, obviously in a completely other socioeconomic category, looking at them. Um, what I learned doing research for this talk, this is really interesting. You know, Ouija is known for arriving places quickly, which we'll see in a minute with his crime scenes and getting whatever he finds. 
This one, it turns out, was actually kind of set up. He asked an assistant to go find this woman and put her in the shot so that this juxtaposition of the rich ladies with, with kind of the nearly homeless lady might not be quite as, <laughs> quite as true as we think. But this is probably what Luigi is most famous for. He, in 1938, got himself, got permission to have a police radio in his car. So some of you may have seen that movie Nightcrawler, but it's all about, I wanna be at the crime scenes, either before or with the police. I wanna be the first one that's there and captures the dead body, the dead girl, the mobster that was killed. And this is not his image, because he's in it, but I wanted to show you this is very much what he did. It's like, there's the dead man, there are the cops, and he is right there on the scene. I love this because I live in Hell's Kitchen. I'm glad I'm not seeing that, at least tonight. It's, this is a murder in Hell's Kitchen in, in the 1940s. And again, what's funny about Ouija is this is not a photographer that's interested in creating beautiful prints. You know, he's not really about the prints. These are going to appear in the newspapers. It's about being there fast and about the subject matter. This one is really creepy. Sorry, this is the last time you're going to see something that horrible. Uh, this is, I guess, a criminal that went by David the Beetle. And as you can see, it's, it's really horrendous stuff, but of course people loved this. And he, he, um, he's fascinating because it is said that he was able to kind of have admiration both in the pop kind of media culture, but then also the art world started really respecting what he did. Here's horrible, a girl that jumped out of a, a car on Park Avenue. This one I love because he's showing us not the crime itself or the body, but all the families and the kids that are looking at the scene. Um, and when I saw this, I thought, you know what? Parents today are so much more protective about their kids. I totally cannot envision New York parents hanging out there with their kids looking at the dead body. Here the kids are like, oh my God. Now, get this. Talk about if you thought Walker Evans was intruding on people's privacy on the subway, Ouija got an infrared camera and he got a filtered flash and he went into movie theaters. So next time you're in a dark movie theater, <laughs> you should worry that someone's actually <laughs> taking your picture. Because at most they might have seen like some dark silhouette somewhere. He actually captured lots of people making out. These guys are obviously having a great time. On the right, not so much. She's like, uh, <laughs> I don't think there's gonna be a second date. This one's wild. I mean, you've got lady bored, biting her nails, guy kind of bored. These guys are not so bored. <laughs> I think something is gonna happen there that's a little bit X-rated. So incredible, right? It's very voyeuristic. It's very kind of underground. Let's move to a little bit later, the 50s, the 60s. Many of you know the name Gary Winogrand. He's one of the most important street photographers of the 20th century, and of, especially of his era, the 50s, 60s, 70s. And I thought these were fun, even though he's not a night photographer per se, he did capture a lot of people. He was all about human interaction, people out, and he loved women, and he loved seeing women in that context. And El Morocco, as I've learned, I, I wish I had a time machine because it would be fun to go there, was one of the really glamorous supper clubs. And you can see th this group is really dressed up. Uh, they were known for these boots with this zebra stripes. And it's just fun to go back and see how dressed up people were. And of course, these were the places that had dancing and dinner and 
amazing either comedians or singers. And all I can say is, I'm not sure I want to mess with this guy on the left here. Um, I don't know. Um, Winogrand is known for sometimes capturing these images that are just, they're really observant and they're kind of funny. You know, here you have this couple dancing at El Morocco, but he's captured this woman with her hand on, on his shoulder and this look, it almost looks kind of like, I'm gonna eat him up, I'm like, I'm an animal, you know, like blah. Uh, so really, really intru in a way kind of intrusive, look how close this is, but he goes in and captures this amazing moment of these two people dancing. The other thing he did, which I think is great, is he went to the opera, opening night at the opera, and I just love this because imagine that men still wore top hats in 1955. I, I, I'm <laughs> not wearing that anymore, but I love it. And this one I love because this is very typical of Winogrand. I mean, talk about an image with what you would call an obstructed view when you buy a ticket at the ballet or the opera and they say obstructed view. I mean, there's a huge man practically blocking the image and blurred. And, and a lot of this is blurred, but she's very, very clear. And, and, and I also love that this, this really huge man is kind of like peering out from above the bald, head, the bald man's head. But what I love is that she's attending the opera, but if you ask me, she looks like she's in an opera. I mean, she's got this face that, you know, she could be Mimi in La Boheme. She's just very dramatic. I don't know if she lost her, her coat check ticket or what, but she, it's just this fabulous look on her face of like longing. And then this is a really famous image. This is out in LA, but you've got to love this, this scene of this couple in a convertible. It's quite an iconic scene. The cars in the back are moving and this man's kind of looking at us like, like kind of like, you look, you're talking to me and his, his nose is, you're like, what in the world happened? There's a whole narrative here in some of these Winogrand photos where are they going? Did he get into a brawl? Is he part of a gang? <laughs> what in the world is happening? In his book, uh, um, uh, Women Are Beautiful, uh, well, it's an entire book. Winogrand is known for having loved women, and it's a, an entire book of women in all kinds of different scenes. Uh, interestingly, the book came out right around the time of the women's liberation movement, and some people didn't love it. I don't know. It was almost like this guy's loving women maybe a little bit too much at a time when women are trying to say, I'm not just the recipient of the male gaze. You know, it's kind of like we're not just your beautiful object to look at. So an interesting conversation around that book, but here he captures this I love this because the way she's moving or the, the way she's positioned is, is really quite, it's interesting. It's, it's actually slightly awkward. Um, you kind of wonder like, what are you doing that you're standing that way? Is she dancing? Um, oh, bye. I'm gonna hurry up. I'm gonna show you. Moving very quickly. I wanna spend just a few minutes outside of the US. This photographer is one of the most important photographers from Africa, in this case specifically Mali. Malik City Bay is known for having been an important studio photographer in Bamako, the capital of Mali. And it was at a time when what was a French colony was finding its independence. And so there was almost what they called a youth quake. People were excited, they were looking west, they were looking at the music, and they were dancing and there was kind of an explosion of happiness. And these images are all very often of these young people dancing and, and there's just so many diagonals and so much movement and there's arms and there's legs and there's this kind of limbo position. 
and, and he just looks so happy to be alive. And here's this wonderful couple, another iconic photograph of City Bay. And again, this lovely couple, they look so happy and so joyful. And I just, I love the composition. I love the fact that they almost look like symbiotic, you know, they're like facing each other in something that almost looks completely yin and yang. And then here, this gentleman dancing the merengue. So I wanted to just show you that this is one of the artists that was also capturing nightlife way, way far in Africa. Now get ready, because the next one's probably the most controversial of the voyeuristic ones. In the early 70s, this gentleman, that's his pseudonym, because what he was doing was so illicit and so weird and so kind of controversial that he was not using his name. He started walking around Tokyo at night, and guess what he bumped into? He bumped into the fact that a lot of the parks in Tokyo were full of people having sex. And he was like, hell, this is really interesting. I'm going to take photographs. So we went from Walker Evans on the subway to Ouija inside the movie theaters, and now we've got full-on young Japanese photographer taking pictures of sex in the parks. And what's wild about these is that it's not just that the people are having sex, it's that there are all these voyeurs and kind of participants watching that. And I want you to think about how interesting that is because he's now a voyeur of the voyeurs, right? I'm taking photographs of the people looking at these scenes. And I mean, they're relatively explicit. I mean, these people are having sex. These are kind of crawling up to them. This guy's doing, you know what? And, and, and you have, I think, this kind of really weird, carnal, animalistic thing going on. It's almost like the parks really are like jungles. Um, I want you to know that when this was taken, both premarital sex was absolutely not accepted in Japan, nor was gay sex either. So where do you go? You go to parks. Um, so uh, this is, look, this stuff was happening in parks all over the place. It just so happens that this gentleman went and recorded it. And he published it in a gazette or a publication. And he got all these people that, you know, followers that said, this is amazing. Uh, but it was very illicit. This, this would have been illegal to take these. The activities are illicit. Taking the photos were illicit. <laughs> Distributing the photos would have been illicit. Now we get to one of the most fun parts of this talk because it's, it's one of the parts where I'm most jealous of not having been around in the 60s and the 70s. So now we're back and we're going to spend a little time looking at some of the people that recorded nightlife in New York City. And, and by the way, it, I need to be clear, this entire talk hasn't been exhaustive, nor is this section. I chose, kind of curated some people that I found and some who will introduce that were recommended to me. There was a Croatian busboy in Max's, Kansas City. <laughs> Someone told him, you should work in this place as a busboy. It's full of celebrities. It's a really fun place to be. So he got a job there. And guess what? One of the waitresses was Debbie Harry, who would become Blondie. And Max's Kansas City, it turns out, down in Park Avenue, was one of the most happening venues in New York at the time. And when you look at Google and you look at the list of artists, and I, I, I mean artists of art, I mean like Warhol, de Kooning, I mean anyone that was an artist in New York would go there, but also of course these incredible musical talents. And this busboy basically, An Anton Perrick, got exposed to all of these people and took photographs of him. And they would actually let him show his photos. By the way, he met Andy Warhol. And so he became, I believe, quite a contributor kind of, 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 of the world of, you know, I'm also contributing to the, the archives, let's say, or the bodies of photographs we're taking. This whole section that we're going to cover is interesting because it involves a lot of celebrities. 
um, you know, Brassai wasn't taking photos of celebrities, not necessarily, nor was Bill Brandt and so on. Um, we're getting into a moment here where one of the fun parts of being in these, these clubs is that not only were people dressed and behaving in, fa in fantastic and fun ways, but they were also filled with people that were very well known. So Andy Warhol, I should tell you, is in these venues all the time, everywhere. As I've explored the various photographers of this era, you can tell he was everywhere. <laughs> Every photographer took Andy Warhol. And as we will talk, Andy Warhol was shooting everyone as well with his camera. Here you've got Warhol and Mick Jagger. Speaking of the artist, here's Willem de Kooning. And then some of you may know Candy Darling was one of kind of Warhol's muses who was an actress and in a lot of his films, but also quite a personality. Um, and then there's Warhol. And one of the things about Warhol is, I have to say, I think most of the mainstream audience thinks of him as, you know, he did the Elvises and the Liz Taylors and the paintings and the silk, you know, the silk screens. They don't know his photography as much. He took tons of photographs, I think certainly, especially in the 70s and 80s. And in a way, it's not surprising because if you think of Warhol, so much of his art had been based on photographic images. His Jackie Kennedys, his Liz Taylors, his Elvises, all of that is from photographs. So he decided, I'm going to run around with cameras all over the place. These are just examples, and frankly, they're from a little bit later. Here he is with a super young Brooke Shields. Here's Bianca Jagger and De uh, Debbie Harry. But I'm going to leave it at that, because what I want you to know is that the Andy Warhol photograph archive is so enormous. I found this in the Stanford libraries. You can actually see all the contact sheets that he took from 76 to 87. So if you, you get bored during COVID, I enlarged just one. And there's Ian McKellen and here's Sting. The number of celeb he was he was basically obsessed with celebrities. I mean, he loves celebrities. Let's face it, that's that was one of his his areas of focus since early on. And he knew everyone, he was in these venues all the time, and he ran around with a camera constantly. So that's all I'm going to say about Warhol because it's almost like I just want you to know you can go and see like this is what was happening at the Saint that night. This is what was happening in Studio 54 that night and just hundreds of photographs. Let me talk about uh, a photographer by the name of Rose Hartman and I have to credit my friend Christian because he's the one that brought her to my attention. Uh, Rose Hartman is a woman that very early on found her way into places like Studio 54. She's a small lady, and I will say this twice, she had sharp elbows. In the documentary that came out about her, she's described as someone that will literally push her way through a crowd, and I mean literally, until she can capture celebrities fairly close up, uh, not a shy lady. And you know what, it worked for her. I think she probably um, got a lot of people a little bit angry, She's a little bit controversial in her methods. But what she was able to do is she would capture these unbelievable moments. And at Studio 54, this is probably her most iconic image of Bianca Jagger at her 30th birthday party, when suddenly a horse came out and that was like part of the exciting stuff about Studio 54 is that, you know, they, they raise the bar on everything, like constant theme parties. There's going to be a horse and Bianca Jagger comes out in it. And one of the things Rose Hartman talks about in her documentary is the idea of, I don't want them posing for me. The whole idea was, I want to run up to these people and catch them before they're actually looking at me and smiling because that's just boring. Um, so to all those kids now that pose for Instagram, 
she wouldn't have been, you know, this, don't pose, just I want to catch you. So here she's cap capturing these kind of very intimate moments, even in a huge venue. It's almost like, oh, there's Diana Ross with Halston. Um, here's Vogue's Diana Vreeland with Jerry Hall. But, you know, they're not posing for her. She's gone really close. She's captured them. Here's Sophia Loren. She looks so gorgeous today. I can't believe she smoked that much, but there she is. <laughs> and by the way, I will say throughout this whole talk, I've been reminded how much smoking has happened through the 70s. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce an artist I just got to know. And I don't want to put her too much on the spot. I'm going to try to do my best at speaking about her work, but then I want to introduce her to you because she's on this call. So Meryl, I'm going to take a stab at describing what I've learned about you, and then I want you to please introduce yourself because uh, the point about Meryl Meisler is that um, she was right there in New York during that era as well. The difference is that she actually had a day job in the public school system of New York. And so the difference is she didn't get to release her archive of amazing photography of that era until she published some books in 2014 and 2015. So she, she is now getting enormous recognition. She's represented by Clamp Art. And I love, because I went to her website and I love that it's it's very up to date. She's wearing the mask. And these are the two books that Meryl has published thus far of her work. And I just want to show you how amazing these are because again, Meryl was also there and capturing these amazing scenes. In this case, here we have Gloria Steinem. And, um, and she is kind of looking right at us or the camera, but again, she's involved with someone. Uh, but, it, but again, it's this, this amazing, amazing moment. And I love that Meryl captured not only the celebrities, but just the fascinating people. Because, you know, Studio 54 and some of these venues were just known for people that went, were just, they got all dressed up. They came up with the most fascinating costumes. And this woman with a bouffant, and she's got a TNM around her neck. And again, that I haven't seen that look in so long, right? Because it just doesn't happen anymore. The whole like I'm holding the drink and the cigarette, and I'm about to burn the lady, because you know who we used to get burned all the time. And someone would say I'm sorry, but I I just love this. I love that she's not posing. She's not looking at us. She's looking away and um, and then I, I love this too because Meryl's taking us inside the ladies room at Studio 54 so hey let's face it the action's not just by the dance floor it's and I love this this woman's all dressed up and she's like drying her hands because we've got to take a break This, these are celebrities, and I love that Meryl captured the village people, and that's so fantastic. And I, I love because this does have this kind of decisive moment feeling to it, which is, you know, they're, they're about to go somewhere. We don't know where, but, I, you know, he's literally, the Indian is behind, and he's caught, like, kind of, like, descending from the staircase. And then I love this because, again, it just shows you one of the other really famous venues at the time, no longer here either, CBGB, you know, basically the place that gave, gave rise to whether it's the Talking Heads or Blondie or, well, so many, so many, many people. The B-52s played there. I'm sure the Velvet Underground. And I love this, and Meryl will have to fill us in, but this woman's holding, I, you're going to have to tell me what this, to me it looks like she's, she's right outside of CBG, but she just did her shopping. It's just very funny. I, I don't know, it, it looks like I just did my shopping at the deli, I have a flower in my mouth, but I'm outside of CBGB. So 
I'm very, I'm, I love this, I'm very intrigued. Um, and before I introduce Meryl, I, I want to promote her and promote this era, because for those of you that are in New York right now, the Brooklyn Museum has an exhibition called Studio 54 Night Magic. It's, it's running till November 8th. I think they have, they have drawings, they have costumes, they have photography, they have everything you would want to see to be transported to Studio 54. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take a second, if Meryl doesn't mind, and I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello there. Um, thank you, Efren. You know, I don't know what that person is holding outside of CBG. <laughs> person is but the the guy all the way to the left kind of looking at it reminded me of the picture the Ouija picture to me the one with the the opera and the, someone's looking like a critic yeah I didn't even realize that was female but that that lurking per, person to the side I I've made many photographs that I I think are reminiscent of that Ouija picture that's so great and Versailles was totally an inspiration to me when I was going out at night because he brought his camera. I mean, I, I don't go out to photograph. I photograph where I'm going and that's still who I am. But his photographs of the, of the nightlife of Paris, I was very aware that this is my nightlife. Oh, don't we miss nightlife. Don't we really miss going out, <laughs> you know, like people. I uh, also was not familiar with the work of Vargas. That was fascinating, fascinating, oh. fascinating. Did you people? Does anyone? Does anyone? Um, I'm from. I grew up in Massapequa, and I learned afterwards that Candy Darling is from Massapequa. That it was always very impressive. Do you have any questions and about any of the specific photographs? I'd be glad to sh share anything. And, and I write, who is that woman with the T in M? She's so amazing and the T looks like the T in the New York Times T. And I want someone to identify her. <laughs> she's, some, she's obviously somebody. But I'll, okay, I'll give a plug. The Studio 54 Night Magic Show is amazing. And if you're a little fearful of going to museums now, they have it, you have to make a reservation. It is so limited. It's almost like having a museum to yourself. You, were, you couldn't be any safer. And it's an incredible show of the fashion and the jewelry and the music and photographs, not just the Studio 54, but other nightlife before. If, you're, if you love New York City, it'll, it'll make, make you wild. It's, I, I, it, it, do make a it's, it's the safest way to go out and have fun and, and see this show is in, it's incredible thank you so much Meryl and by the way one of the things that that I'll I'll be talking with you and others about and, and maybe with the group is you know these artists some of them require like deeper dives so I would love to spend more time with you potentially one day and you can tell us if we can dive more deeply with you and do a little interview and see your work because it would just be fantastic to really, you know, it, it doesn't do it justice to look at four or five photographs. Thank but you. thank you so much for being here for this talk. And now you kind of get an idea of what this is about, but it's, it's, it's been on my mind that maybe we want to do like deeper explorations of artists and that would be really fun. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much. So I know we're at the top of the hour. I am going to share my screen, but you know what? I think in the interest of time, I, we're, not, we're just not going to cover everyone. I, I think what I'm going to do, I want you to know that there, there are two other artists that we were going to see. One of them, many of you saw during our women on both sides of the lens, Nan Golden, uh, she's a huge figure of of the era of the 80s. You'll remember, I'll just show you, well, first of all, I'm not sure. I am sharing, right? Yeah. Uh, just to remind you that, you know, in, in her 
kind of seminal ballad of sex, the ballad of sexual dependency. Uh, what she did is she took hundreds and hundreds of photographs, you'll remember. In, in her case, they're very, very often more about what she almost calls like her intimate family of friends. You know, they're not strangers on the street. They're not just people at clubs. It's very much this idea of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm collecting a whole archive of the people in my immediate world of the 70s and the 80s. And so very often, you know, the titles will be called, you know, Nan or Cookie and uh, just as you see here, uh, uh, Trixie on the cot. Uh, and, and you'll remember, we won't go into it again, she, she is working in color, which at night brings forward a, a whole other set of, of, of issues. But I don't want you to forget her. We covered her in a little bit more depth at a previous time. Uh, someone that I understand Meryl knows, uh, and I just discovered him recently, is Ken Schles. Uh, a word that's interesting for us to think about is the word flaneur. Uh, just like voyeur comes from the French, that's people that are looking around for almost like sexual pleasure, kind of in a voyeuristic way. A flaneur is someone that, it goes back to that era of the late 19th century when you have those men walking around the boulevards of Paris with the big hat. And you know, they're kind of the men of leisure, they don't really have to work, and they're kind of exploring the evening in Paris. And here you have someone like Ken that, was not a fancy man of leisure in Paris. He's someone that was living in a kind of a broken down building from what I understand in 1983 in the East Village. Um, and he decided, you know, I'm gonna go around the streets of New York again in the 80s and again, working in black and white and record what goes on. And I just thought this image was amazing because of course it's just, the masses of people dispersing after firework displays. Um, he does also have several photographs. I loved these for me because these clubs I did get to see. <laughs> so I did make it to the limelight. Um, I, I find this fascinating because even though this is inside a club, uh, again, there's this focus on this woman and she doesn't look that happy. You know, it captures almost this nighttime loneliness. Like even though she's out at the club, she's drinking and I don't know, it doesn't look like a very good night. And so there's, there's something tough about this. Um, I love this one because the Palladium was one of the very happening clubs on 14th Street at the time. And it captures almost this motion and glamour of kind of going up into this kind of like, I'm going into the palace. Um, and then I just thought I would throw this one in because Veselka is still around and well. Some of you may know that Veselka is a Ukrainian 24 hour restaurant in the East Village. And it's known for, first of all, having been there forever, but being very much kind of a place where people go even after the clubs, you could go at 3 a.m. and have some borscht. And, and, and there's something incredibly almost film noir about this. There's the cigarettes, there's the drinks. We don't actually see the sitter's face. There's the cigarette the other person's looking at the newspaper. I, I just, I love the composition. I love that it kind of takes you to this little corner of the cell guy in a very kind of intimate way. And I'm gonna close, cause I know we're at the end. You're gonna love this artist. I took the freedom of, I know I'm skipping like 20 years or more. It's almost like, I love Studio 54, love the limelight palladium. Okay, sorry, 90s, I'm not covering you. I'm not covering the club kids of the 90s. Um, we're gonna end with Matthew Pillsbury. He's an artist represented by Ben Ruby Gallery. And what I think is fantastic about this is that, remember when we talked about very early on, the long exposures being a problem? Because they're oh my God, I have to stand here and I hope no, nothing moves or no buggies go by because I want it to be a perfect image. Matthew Pillsbury turns that upside down and says, I'm in the 2000s, I want long exposure. I want to capture 
this crazy blurry stuff that happens when I basically expose this image to all these moving people. And this is the iconic rainbow room. And by the way, he's working with a really large format camera. And so these are some of those really, really enormous prints, you know, that, that you now see um, amongst contemporary photographers. And here, you know, he's gone beyond New York. Here he's at the very top of a building in Hong Kong. One of the things he talks about in his videos is he loves the idea of the interaction of people and light and technology. And for better or for worse now, in the image, you see everyone on their phones. So a lot of the light you're seeing there are everyone holding their phones. And I'm gonna close with this really magnificent image of people out and about on the Coney Island boardwalk. Cause again, there's color and light and creatures out at night having fun. And, and it's this wild thing where it's like, he's all about the long exposure. I want blurry, I want movement. I, I don't want the still image. And the last thing I thought would be fun is to say that, you know, this is, over a hundred years later. This is one of the earliest photographs of Coney Island from 1905. And I thought we would close with this kind of lovely comparison of Coney Island in 1905 and Coney Island in, 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 in our days. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm gonna uh, unmute you and stop the sharing and um, open it up for questions and comments. And I do apologize that it's 7.09. Okay, so how do I do this now? Let's see. Um, okay, I think you.